Welcome to our Sound for Video session, and today is the 16th of February, 2020. And we're going to do a few things tonight. Um, number one, we're going to talk a little bit about Dante, and I'm not really, um, I'm not a Dante expert, but just getting started with Dante myself, but I think it's an interesting thing to learn about. So if, um, for production sound, it is a technology that probably will become more prominent over time. And certainly when you're working on bigger productions, you will encounter Dante at some point. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then of course, after that, we do have some, uh, we'll have spend some time on the question and answer. And uh, let's go ahead and jump in and get started. So first of all, what is Dante? Let me just kind of switch over to the Mac screen here and uh, show you what we've got here. So this is uh, Audinate's website. Should we just leave it right there? See if I can make that a little bigger. There we go. Okay, so the idea with Dante, and, and let me just kind of give some background. I think that you'll find Dante presently is a lot more uh, prominent in uh, front of house type of mixing that by front of house if you haven't heard that term before what that means is basically live sound mixing especially in uh, various venues like theaters um, often it's 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 where you have kind of an installed system so um, that'll be like a theater or some, some other place like that um, and and the idea is that if you've ever done live sound you know that you have a mixing board that's sitting back in the audience at some point and then you also have to run a big snake. And a snake is a big bundle of cables, um, a bunch of XLR cables that run up to the stage. And some of them some of them run from the stage. You'll have a stage box where you plug in all your microphones and instruments. That runs back up to the mixer. And then you also have some lines that are coming back down from the mixer up into the power amplifiers and the speakers. So that's the typical scenario with doing live sound reinforcement or um, installed sound front of house mixing and the challenge is is those snakes are a pain <laughs> now in installed systems it's not as big of a deal but in um, they're, they're expensive cables too but um, it's a lot more it's of a big deal when you're at a location um, and I've done music festivals before where you have to run the snake from the mixer up to the stage so on and so forth so the the kind of the main thing I think or where it's more prominent right now is that Dante allows you to do that instead of sending that massive snake up through the audience and then up onto the stage instead you can use a single cat 5e or cat 6 network cable the same thing you use to compute you know for computers uh, you can use a single one of those cables to run a whole bunch of channels of audio both up to the mixer and back out to the power amplifier and then to your speakers. So you can go from a massive, massive bundle of cables down to a single network cable. Now, that's just one scenario. And in fact, there are a lot of different devices that have um, kind of their own proprietary version of this. So instead of it being actually Dante, they have their own implementation. So for example, the mixer that I have is a, an Allen and Heath mixer, and they have a technology called S-Link. And it's basically, that same thing, you run a network cable from your mixer up to a stage box. And in fact, let me just pull one of those up while we're talking about it here. Um, so you run a stage box, a cable between the stage box and your mixer. And um, what that allows you to do is a similar type thing. Instead of having to run a snake, you can run like a single network cable. So that's kind of cool. Um, let me just see if I can pull one up here to give you a picture of what they look like. Here we go. Do, do, do. In fact, we'll just share our screen here. So here is, let's even get a closer up on that. So basically this is a big box you put up on your stage and you can see it has 16 inputs and eight outputs. And so you can plug all your microphones and instruments into these and um, then you would run these outputs to the power amplifiers and the speakers or to the stage monitors. And so 
Um, the interesting thing with this is, again, a single cable between the stage and the mixer and to this. Now, what you'll think, if you kind of put some thought into this, what you'll realize is what's happening is in this box right here, when you plug a microphone in, the preamplifier and the analog to digital converter is inside of this box. And then you're just sending the digital audio over the network cable to the mixer. And uh, likewise, from the mixer, the output signals are digital signals that come here. And then behind these, we would have digital to analog converters um, and amplifiers that would feed the line level signals out of these right here. So that's the idea behind those. And that's just one scenario. That's Dante can also do that as well. Um, but the limitation on some of those technologies that are built into the mixers, the more proprietary technologies, is often they are built mainly just to eliminate a snake. Um, they're not, they don't have the full network capability that Dante has. So let me just show you a couple things here. I'm going to switch back over to the Dante, the Audinate website. Audinate's the company. Um, that uh, that put together Dante, which is basically it's a it's an audio network protocol, and so it allows you over a single Cat five and Cat or Cat six cable to run multiple channels of digital audio between any devices that are also connected to that Dante network. And so, let me just switch over here to give you an example of one. I'm going to switch to my camera here. Right here, what I have is a little product from Here Technologies. It's called the Switchback Matrix. And what this little product does is you have a box here that has two analog microphone inputs plus a third, a third one here that's a stereo 3.5 millimeter unbalanced input. So I can connect two microphones plus a stereo signal here. You can see I have the network cable. So this is connected to my network. And then on the front, I have a variety of different things. So I have a headphone jack, and then I have controls for each of the different Dante channels here. So basically what this is, is this is like, um, this could be used for a couple of different things. Number one, if I'm a performer out on stage and uh, we are feeding our audio via Dante, what I can do is I can set up a, a, um, an in-ear mix from this device right here, and I can tune it to exactly what I want to hear. So when I'm doing live music, the, the challenge is, is when you're a musician performing, you need to have a mix of the band in your, in your ears <laughs> in some fashion, either stage monitors or in-ear monitors. And a lot of times the musicians are really pretty picky, and for good reason, to have a specific mix that kind of suits what they're trying to accomplish. So if I am the drummer, um, obviously I'm going to want to hear the drums, but I also need to hear some of the other band. And I might want to hear the bass a little bit more than the other instruments, because in, for example, a, a band where you have a bass and drums, oftentimes the bass and drums kind of are really tied at the hip. Um, a lot there, there are a lot of the rhythm of the overall music performance in many cases. And so for the drummer, it may be really important to hear a good mix of the bass and maybe a little bit less of the guitars and the vocals. Um, but in any case, that's what this device does. So this could be an interesting device for a variety of different situations. Now, in the production sound world, or in the even in, in the location sound mixing world, you might ask, okay, well, where does this even matter? <laughs> How is this relevant in those situations? This could be something that if I'm working on a production where the mixer is sitting out um, in or by Video Village, that's usually a little ways away from the set. Um, the mixer may be sitting there, but the boom operator will be right up on set in the action because they have to be booming the microphone out over the talent. This could potentially be a type of thing that they could use in that scenario. Now, um, a lot of boom operators are actually using wireless, but this would be a way to do it in a wired fashion, um, but having a fairly lightweight cable, just a single RJ, or, you know, RJ45 connector, Cat6, Cat5e cable. And of course, they could feed in a, um, you know, their boom mic here, or if there were two boom operators, you could even fit, feed in two different channels here. So, and then of course, they could get a mix back from the mixer of exactly what they wanted, and they would have their own control over it too. So they wouldn't necessarily have to rely on the mixer to kind of fine tune things for them. They could tune it in themselves right here. So that's kind of an interesting. Um, that's where where Dante becomes kind of an interesting kind of situation for production sound. Um, 
obviously for all sorts of live situations, Dante is super helpful because again, you can you can put the various audio devices out on a network and be able to do things. So for, in my case, corporate um, AV work, um, I may have a situation where I have a presentation going on and I have people in various rooms and I might want to feed the audio to another room. Well, rather than having to run a bunch of audio cables or try and get wireless working from one side of the building to the other, um, I've already got a network installed in the building. And so what I could potentially do is have a Dante receiver in the remote room and actually play back the audio in that remote room. So that's where Dante can become a pretty interesting thing. Um, let me just show you another thing here on screen. Um, I don't have the whole thing set up right now, the whole, like the whole network. I'm still waiting on a better, I have to get a different um, network switch <laughs> to make this work. That is one thing. There are some limitations. Number one question I think people ask before I get on to, to showing you this here is, can I do this over Wi-Fi? And Dante is not supported over Wi-Fi. Um, and the reason for that is that the current Wi-Fi standards just don't provide the level of um, like guaranteed latency, uh, low latency that you need. So that's another thing that I haven't said about Dante as well is that it also ensures synchron um, synchronization of audio channels, which is critical, and also um, low latency. So it can operate at a very, very low latency, which again is important as well because you don't want things that are, you know, if someone speaks into a microphone, you don't want that arriving at the mixer or its destination, whatever that may be, half a second later. So you need something that's very high or very low latency. And that's another thing that Dante helps you with here. So let's switch over to the screen here again. So this is what's called the Dante controller here, an app that runs on Mac or PC. And um, you can see here it's recognized our device. So here our is our matrix. Now I don't have any other devices on screen right now. It turns out that my sound device is 888 is also a Dante enabled device. So once I get my switch set up, I can actually connect that here too. And then what I can do is I can actually run, switching back here, I can run audio from this out in my studio into the control room here to my sound devices 888. And, and the reason I might want to do that, for example, is if I'm doing a automated dialogue replacement session, I may want to have the actor or maybe a Foley artist out in the acoustically treated area or the kind of the, the studio area where I want them recording. And I can be operating the mixer in my little mix suite here. So um, that's another example of where you could do something along these lines. So let's switch back over here to the Mac screen, okay. Um, let me just show you here. So again, the matrix here is attached to the network and I can pull up the device here and actually I can show you some things here. So I can actually rename the devices, making them a little easier to find and identify on the network. You can change the sample rate. So we can support in this particular device between 44.1 kilohertz sample rates up to 96 kilohertz sample rates. And you can see here it's recording in PCM 24-bit format. So basically WAVE, the same, the same thing that WAVE uses, PCM um, in 24-bit. So, and you can see here the latency is very low. So in most cases, I believe the Dante enabled devices will generally support at least, at the, at the worst, a 10 millisecond um, latency, but many of them are going to be much faster than that here. So um, in this case, it can support down to a one millisecond latency. So some pretty interesting things. So I guess um, that's kind of the high level overview of, well, I guess I gave a couple of examples. Um, in the coming weeks here, I'll be working a little bit more with this, um, with the matrix here and kind of doing some demonstrations in some of the upcoming videos. So if this is of interest to you, keep your eyes peeled for that and uh, we'll get you some information on that. All right. Let's uh, go take a look here. We did have a couple of questions that were submitted ahead of time. So we'll switch over into the question and answer session here really quickly. And let me just do a switch to the keynote and we will start the keynote here. All right, first we have a question from Klaus who says, thanks so much for answering my question last episode. So here's another one. I hope you find the time to answer and maybe debate. Um, all right, <laughs> this could turn into something fun. 
Uh, recently, some manufacturers have released some mics that emulate the more expensive and well-known mics. For example, the Cinco Mic D2, which is made to emulate the Sennheiser MKH416. So I think here, in this case, the Cinco Mic D2 is approximately a $200 to $250 microphone, as I understand it. Sennheiser MKH416 sells for about $1,000 US. And then there's also, he also gives the example of the Stellar X2, which is evidently supposed to mimic the Neumann U87. The Neumann U87, if I understand, if I remember correctly, last time I checked, somewhere in the $2,700 price range for that microphone. It's a classic. Um, there's the, the newest version is the U87i, um, but they've been making various iterations of the U87 for some number of years now. And, and in fact, uh, most of the music, uh, at least popular music that you've heard out there, not most of it, I should say, certainly... Over the years, if you've listened to popular music, you've probably heard a vocalist singing into a Neumann U87, <laughs> and and in some cases, guitars playing into, um, you know, their amplifiers playing into a U87, so definitely a common microphone. Some of them are actually pretty good and very close to the original. These microphones are pretty cheap, and I think the value in these mics will make it easier for newcomers to get some great sounding gear. I would really love to hear your perspective on this. Is it a good thing, or is it pure piracy? I don't think any professional will use them, but prosumers, maybe. All right. Well, Klaus, that's a fair question, and I don't know that I have the definitive answer on that. But what I will say is um, I think competition is good, certainly, and it's not unusual for, um, you know, one company to say that my microphone is every bit as good as this other classic microphone. That 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 doesn't bother me. Um I will say this about the Cinco Mic D2 in particular. I have not used the Stellar X2. The Cinco Mic D2, we talked about that a while ago. Um, I do actually have a copy of it here. I was getting ready to review it, and the the company, the actually it was a, it was one of the sister companies or brother company, however you want to put it, um, that does the marketing in the in the retail sales for Cinco, um, was basically paying people to do five star reviews on Amazon. So to me, that seemed a little that seemed bothersome. I was bothered by that. I didn't like the idea of doing that. Um, they didn't pay me, but still, I didn't. it just felt kind of dirty, and I didn't want to be involved. So in any case, we'll put that aside. Um, but what I can say about that microphone is that there are some corners they've cut. It's not the same thing as a Sennheiser MKH-416. Number one, it's not, a, it's not an RF bias microphone. The... Um, and, you know, and what are the practical implications of that may not hold up as well in super humid environments. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Haven't tested it, so I don't know for sure. Um, its output impedance is very different. So the Cinco Mic D2, from what I can tell, may be much more demanding on a microphone preamplifier than the MKH416 is. Another thing to consider. So um, does it sound as good as the Sennheiser MKH416? I think um, Mike Delgadio over on Booth Junkies actually reviewed it, and um, he put it right next to his 416, and I think in a vocal booth, yeah, if you're doing voiceover and you're working in nice and close to it, it sounded basically identical. And um, so that's great. Yeah, if you're going to be using it in a situation like that, probably that's fine. I don't know anything about the Stellar X2, and I would say that the Cinco Mic D2 um, based on the reviews I've seen, and again, I haven't worked with it extensively myself, but based on what I've seen, um, I'm not sure that the polar pattern is exactly the same. Get the sense that the MKH416 is a little bit more directional, which is neither a good nor a bad thing necessarily, just depends on what you need. Um, I would also be highly skeptical that Cinco would be as, it, it would be as easy to get it serviced if you needed to, or perhaps um, call in a warranty. I don't know. That's a guess. Um, but so those are kind of just some of my, my high-level thoughts. Is it pure piracy? Well, if they actually had cracked open an MKH-416 and tried to copy all the circuitry, yes. And I don't, I'm not, I'm not an advocate of that. But if they design their own and they, they think that, you know, and they want to sell it and say, hey, we think this is, you know, for one quarter of the price is just as good as a Sennheiser MK416, they're at liberty to do that. I don't, I don't have an issue with that. Um, but is it good enough? I think in, in a lot of cases for, cons for prosumers or consumers, yeah, it probably is good enough. So those are some of my thoughts on there. I'd be interested to see what you guys think down below. 
All right, we'll go to our next question here. Next is from Dick, and this is actually a question about Dante. And Dick, um, I am, in full disclosure, I am just getting started with Dante, so I'm not an expert. Um, so I'm not going to be able to answer all of this, but let's just run through it anyway. Dick says, I'm starting with the Dante via, uh, Dante via software on my Mac. So for those that uh, we didn't cover that yet, Via is one of the applications that Audinate provides. It's Dante capable. And essentially what it allows you to do is play... It allows you to plug in USB-enabled audio devices, like so, for example, um, maybe Rode's new uh, USB microphone. I can't even remember what it's called. I get, evidently, there's one on the way to me um, for review. But um, you could plug that into your computer, and then you could make that microphone available to other Dante-enabled devices on the network. So that's what the VIA software does. Um, so he's using it on his Mac with the latest version of the Mac OS. So in that case, I assume it's it's Catalina. Running on more than one machine, but I am not able to link by the Dante controller. It gives an error message. Audinate know the problem, but is working on this. It has to do with Mac OS. Be aware of this problem. I've had it a couple of weeks now, and there's still no solution. So this actually, to me, seems like more of a um, Mac OS issue. And in fact, let's talk about this. I'm going to... Put me back on the screen here. We need to have a talk, people. Here's the reality. I am running macOS Mojave on my iMac Pro here. And I'm doing that intentionally. Catalina has been out since I think September or October of last year. If you're doing audio and you're making money with it, you have to be, and I think most everyone that's that's in this situation knows this already, but you can't be bleeding edge on your operating system, unfortunately. Um, it's just the, the reality. I'm still waiting for Universal Audio to update their drivers, to certify their drivers as Catalina compatible. Um, and, and I did the same thing on the previous version of Mac OS. I didn't upgrade for probably, I think it was five or almost six months after it had been released. So it took that long for all of the audio drivers to be updated, so on and so forth. So is that the is that Apple's problem or is that the audio gear manufacturer's problem? I think it's probably some of each. Um, I'm not sure how much, a, you know, lead time Apple gives these other developers at the other companies. And, you know, some of these audio companies are pretty small, so they don't have a ton of resources just sitting around um, <laughs> working on stuff like this. I, I don't know. I'm not trying to be an apologist for them, but for whatever reason, it takes a while. So just be careful. Don't necessarily jump on the latest OS as soon as it comes out until you certify that all your gear is going to work with the new operating system. So I usually lag, I'm usually about six, five to six months behind. So just something to consider. And Dick, I, you know, if you really, you know, have to get this working, you might consider going back to Mojave. Um, you may not want to hear that, but I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but that is the reality. And in, in some of these cases, you just have to be really careful. Um, do you have the same problem or do you use another approach? I'm just getting started, so I have not experienced this problem, and I'm not running Catalina, so I have not experienced this. Um, he also wanted to know if I have experience running Dante and NDI video feeds on the same network, and is it stable? I think it's going to depend on your network, really, Dick, um, how much throughput you have, um, the types of switches you're using, so on and so forth. And for those not familiar, NDI video feed is basically a similar type thing where, so for example, I can... Um, uh, how do I describe it? So I could use NDI integration between Skype and my streaming software here, which is called Ecamm Live. Um, I can essentially send an NDI video feed from Skype into Ecamm Live. So I can record and stream my Skype call if I wanted to do that. And it's NDI, which is that technology, which basically shares a video stream between applications, and it can also share... Uh, video streams across a network. And so he's asking if we could do that at the same time that we're sending Dante audio. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's going to depend on your network and it's going to depend on how much other activity is going on there, so on and so forth. So you'll want to watch your Dante control panel and it will give you some readings on network health and whether or not things are going to be working okay. So that's another... Um, thing to consider there. What, in your opinion, are the pros and cons using Dante over USB? Uh, I think he means Dante versus USB to route sound to a computer. I know the length of the cable, of course, 
Um, can I use a sound devices 888 over a mix pre 10T? Okay, we'll come back to that sound devices question later. But um, the yeah, that's the huge the huge uh, difference is not only USB or not only cable length, um, but it's also being able to share it. So I can connect again. I could connect a USB audio device to my computer and make that available to another computer on the Dante network or another mixer on the Dante network. So if for some crazy reason I wanted to, I could connect my sound devices 888 to this Dante network, plug in a USB microphone into my iMac Pro, which is also on the Dante network. I could speak into that microphone and record it on my sound devices 888 over the network as one very simple example. So um, yes, so that's that's one possibility. Now, for those that are not aware, the Sound Devices 888 does have, it is a Dante-enabled device, and it does have an RJ45 jack on the back, so you can connect to a Dante network. So hopefully that answers your questions, Dick, um, and thanks for the questions. I'll probably know a whole lot more over time as I get more experience with Dante. So, all right, I need to take a quick uh, drink here, because I'm getting a little hoarse. Excuse me. And then we'll jump into the questions here in the chat. Okay. Well, welcome to everybody. Got a whole bunch of people here, it looks like. <coughs> Pardon me. Lao, uh, Lao says it's 4 a.m. his time. I highly encourage you to go to bed. <laughs> That's way you shouldn't be up, or I don't know, or maybe you're just an early riser, not sure. Um, Aiden asked about a late night stream. This is, we're kind of switching it up to this week, we're doing a later one. And then other weeks we'll do it earlier in the day so our European friends uh, can join at a better time. Uh, Todd, it's yeah, 10, it's now 10.30 there in New York. Welcome. Andre, it's good to have you here. Uh, we have our, our friend Slav Guns. He's reporting back. Vegas was great. Um, I can put this on the screen here. MD46 did most of the work and turned out great, especially after using Levelator software. Okay, so he's talking about a handheld microphone from Sennheiser called the MD46 interview microphone. Um, I've used it for interviews on the show floors before. It is a great option there. All right. We were talking about uh, Alan and Heath, and Todd says he's got an Allen and Heath 21 channel board that still has VU meters. Wow, that's an older one. <laughs> but yeah, so, uh, sounds wonderful and warm. I would agree. A lot of those analog boards back in the day sounded great. Dylan, hope you're having a good evening and love the videos. As always, I had a question based on what you talked about in your Lav Mic video release the other day. I am looking at upgrading from the stock Lavs on my uh, Sennheiser G G4s. I use an MKH416 for my shotgun mic. I was looking originally at the Cost 11D for all their for their all-around ability, but seeing them side by side, stand by. They are much larger compared to the B6. I know your favorite all around was the Twinplex, but I wasn't sure if the size or how new they are is a concern. More info is that I do short films primarily. Um, well, I would say if you want to keep the voicing similar between them, the Sennheiser MKE2 is worth looking at. Um, the the Sankin is, is definitely larger than the B6. Here's the, I, I like my B6, don't get me wrong but it's not the microphone for every situation. It does have a very boomy sound, especially if you put it on someone's chest, if you're gonna mount it there. Um, so not my favorite, th that wouldn't be my first choice as an all round mic, unless um, the, the B6 is particularly popular in cases where you have a very complex wardrobe and not a lot of places to hide things, or it's actually very popular in theater as well, live theater. Um, in a lot of cases in live theater, they're hiding the microphones in people's hair or just right here around their ear. So um, that's where the B6 really comes in in uh, handy. And for example, I like putting it in hats as well. It does sound great when you put it in hats. It has a, a much more balanced sound to it, but it just sounds a little too bass heavy when you put it right on someone's chest, especially men. So that's the only, re the only reservation I would have about uh, kind of considering it your all-round microphone. So I would take a look at the MKE2. If you want something, if you are going to be mounting things mostly on people's chests, um, I that's why I like the Twinplex. It seems to do pretty well there. So um, it is a little bigger than the B6 for sure. 
The Senkin actually hides pretty well too. Even though it's long, it's pretty skinny. So it's not too hard to hide that actually. And it's a super durable mic. The only downside with the Senkin from my point of view is that um, that cable's pretty thick. So if you're gonna be hiding it on someone that's wearing very form-fitting clothing, that can be a little tricky to hide that cable. So that's a consideration there. But I, I really think that it, to start, a Senkin is a really great place to start. Um, You'll never, I don't think you'll ever regret purchasing a Sankin Cost 11D, is my, is my case. All right, um, Alexi is asking if I can please do a review of Deity. Um, I assume you're talking about the Deity lavalier microphones, the pro-level lavs that they're supposed to be releasing. I talked to Andrew over at Deity, and he is planning to send some to me, but they're still trying to work out the, um, the terminations that I need for my Audio Limited A10. So it will get here eventually. Um, but, uh, not yet. So, oh yeah. And here's a follow-up from Alexi. Deity WLAV Micro and Pro. I was impressed with the sound speed review. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely in the plans. Um, as soon as I get them, we'll, we'll get on that. All right, Rob. If memory serves, Podcastage reviewed the Stellar X2 and found it wanting. Interesting. Okay. So there's some input there on the Stellar X2, which is supposed to be a Neumann U87 clone. Um, so good. Yeah. Podcast does great reviews and he has a lot of interesting insights. So I would definitely consider looking at that. If you are looking at the stellar X2, good info. All right, Andrew, uh, just got a 633 and the boom is on channel one and have been recording that channel. Now I am trying to use the road link on channel two, but it is not set up right. The led is blinking on channel two, but led is solid on channel one. The road link receiver is connected properly to the transmitter and the track is armed. Let's see if there are any follow-ups here. Hope that made sense. Can give more clarification if needed. Okay. So uh, the problem is you're not getting audio. So the uh, channel two should be set to microphone level, not line level, because the road link delivers a um, microphone level signal. I'm assuming that you're using the 3.5 millimeter to XLR connector, the Rode VXLR. You do not need the VXLR Plus, um, so the VXLR should do the job just fine. And then from there, it's usually a matter of setting the gain on the 633. Um, I don't know if I've missed something else that you aren't doing, perhaps, but uh, make sure it's not set to line level. You do not want to set it to line level for the Rode Link. It's a consumer grade wireless system, so it's not feeding a line level signal. That's my guess as to why you're not getting a signal. Um, but then you also said something about LEDs. Let's just go back and take a look at that. Uh, where was that? Here it is. LED is blinking on channel two, but LED is solid on channel one. I assume you're in the channel menu for channel number two. And yeah, when you're in the channel menu, it will blink. That's normal. Roadlink is connected properly to the TX and the track is armed. Yeah, that's about all I've got for you. If you have any other information, let us know. But uh, that would be the first thing I'd check is make sure you're on mic level, not line level. Todd, I recently needed parts for 10, for a 10 plus MKH416 and they sent them NC due to the low cost offered reasonable ship in rebuild program. Wow, okay. That's good to know. So that's that's an example of serviceability. <laughs> um, Sennheiser, yeah, Sennheiser definitely has the facilities to do repairs on their microphones. So um, when you're spending that thousand dollars, you're getting more than just a microphone. You're getting a company behind it that can actually take care of it if you need to. So good to know. Uh, Rob, Podcastage also reviewed the Stellar X2 Vintage, and that one may be where Bandrew was less impressed. Okay, good to know. So there looks like a couple of different models there. What is making you start the journey into Dante? Just staying up to date with tech? Yeah, I think that's probably the best way to put it. I think for me, Dante is going to be most interesting as a start for me doing live sound. So I've got my uh, Allen & Heath SQ5. I've got a, um, uh, let's see, Electra Voice, whatever their pillar um speaker system is called. I can't remember what it's called. Um, 
but it's actually it works pretty nicely but for me it's going to be a lot easier if we can use dante or s link to to connect those two as opposed to running a big snake because a lot of times um they're going to be relatively small gigs so i'm not going to be working with massive massive audiences but um, just having a simpler setup and usually it's just me without um yeah, so that, that's the main thing. Just being able to understand the technology, being prepared to use it if I ever do find myself in a situation. At some point when I do have a boom operator, um, I haven't worked up to that level just yet, hopefully soon. Um, but when I do have a boom operator, that's where Dante may come in handy as well. So those are kind of my thoughts on um, why I'm looking at that, Dylan. Um, Lao is in bed. Very good. So 4 a.m. is actually my normal bedtime. Okay, good. That makes a lot more sense. <laughs> Mark, great time for video session for me in Australia. Yes, this is, is I would imagine so. Uh, 2.30 p.m., excellent. All right, Slav, thanks so much. Um, thanks, no, <laughs> thanks again, no questions. Excellent, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that the Las Vegas show went well for you. That was, I'm, thanks for giving us the feedback and letting us know how things went. Shadow Tree Pictures, favorite pocket RGB light. Is that a question? If it's a question, um, we are using back here the Aperture MC. That's one right there. And then there's another one. I don't know if you can see it. Sitting right down there. That's what's putting that uh, cast of light back there. I like those Aperture MCs quite a bit. They are clever. The only downside to them is that they have inbuilt batteries. Wish that weren't the case, but it is. Um, but otherwise, it's a very good light. Scott. I finally got my Mix Pre 6 working. Is it worth upgrading to the Mix Pre 6 2? I have heard editors don't like the 32 bit capability. Thoughts? Okay. <laughs> um, it's really hard to generalize. I imagine there will be some editors that would love 32 bit, and there may be others that just aren't used to it. I think on the video editing side, a lot of them are just not used to it. They don't understand it, they don't know what it can do. Um, for them, it's basically just clipped 24 bit audio. So, um, so yeah, there are going to be some editors that just aren't educated on what it is. So my, my thought is this, um, first of all, let's go back to your first question. Is it worth upgrading to the Mix Pre 6 2? Not necessarily. I think that that can be a fine choice. That can be something worth doing, but here's the thing. I would consider the situations that you're in before you go and upgrade from a Mix, the Mix Pre original to the Mix Pre 2 series. Ask yourself, are you going to be in a situation where you really need 32-bit? Um, and there just aren't that many situations, if you understand how to use your mixer, that you really need 32-bit. It's really, I think the biggest situation that I can think of is with wired boom microphones of some sort, or wired microphones of some sort, where you're not going to have a chance to do your gain staging before the sound occurs. And that's going to be the biggest use case if you're doing location sound or production sound. If you're a videographer, that can be a little bit different. That's when you've got a lot of things going on. You do your best to set your gain staging, but you may have missed it a little bit. You may have over, you know, pushed the gain up too high or not high enough. In those cases, yeah, the 32-bit the wide dynamic range recording capability of the Mix Pre 2 series could be really valuable. So it really depends on your situation. But if you have a specific reason why it would be useful to you, then yeah, I think it could be worth the upgrade. If you don't have a specific reason why it could be useful to your specific type of situation that you typically record, then it's probably not really worth the upgrade from my point of view. So maybe I saved you some money, maybe I haven't. <laughs> or maybe I made the decision easier for you, maybe I haven't. But I wouldn't necessarily go get a Mix Pre 2 uh, just because it can do 32-bit float recording. Um, I think some people end up underwhelmed. Remember, wireless systems generally are not going to be able, able to take advantage of that anyway. Um, generally, and let, well, they they'll be able to take advantage from it in, in the case where you you mess up your gain staging and you don't set it right. Um, but if you if you know if you learn take the time to learn how to set your gain stage up correctly, then there's no advantage with wireless in 32-bit float recording from my perspective. All right. Um, but again, if you are a videographer and you're also operating camera and you're also directing and you're also gaffing and you're also interviewing and you're doing all these other things, then yeah, it could still definitely be worthwhile. 
So those are some thoughts on that. Now, uh, in regards to editors not liking the 32-bit capability, I, I think I started to address that a little bit. If the, the video editing people may not be educated on what it does and how it works. So you will, if you are going to be handing your audio clips off to an editor, you will want to talk with them before the shoot, preferably, and, and ask them, hey, I'd like to do this in 32-bit float. Here's what 32-bit float is. Um, which video editing app are you using to make sure that their app can actually handle it? If they're going to be re if they're going to be editing in DaVinci Resolve, then you probably don't want to be giving them 32-bit float files. Um, you could probably record in 32-bit, but you're going to have to trans you're going to have to bring them into a digital audio workstation and correct any cases where you went above zero dB full scale yourself. Pull that down and then export it into 24-bit and then give it to the editor. Um, otherwise, you're just making their job more difficult. So that that would be a situation where I could see the perspective of an editor finding 32-bit float more difficult to work with is if they're using something like DaVinci Resolve that can't handle 32-bit float. Um, Final Cut Pro 10 can handle it fine. Premiere can handle it fine. Avid Media Composer does... I can't remember... I'd have to check if, whether Avid Media Composer does, but in any case, double check with the editor ahead of time. Just make sure you're giving them something that makes their job easy, not something that makes their job harder. So those are some thoughts there. That's a great question, Scott. I'm really glad you brought that up. And it turns out that Rob agrees. Uh, also, I'm not deity Andrew Jones, clearly. <laughs> yes, I remember the first time I saw your name, I thought, Andrew, is that you? Um, but it is another Andrew Jones. So thanks for clarifying. Also, Scott just booked a flight and a hotel to NAB. Are you going this year? Yes, I am definitely planning to go. Scott, I'd love to meet up with you at some point there. So let's keep in touch and uh, hopefully we can say hello at some point. All right, that was it. I had to set, it was set to line level. Okay, yay, community, we did it. We helped one of our friends here. Uh, and the quote of this stream so far is, now that's serviceability. <laughs> Thanks. I'm glad that worked out. Let's see. When would I be using a line level input? So, um, Andrew, that's going to be mostly when you're working with the pro level wireless systems that put out line level signals. So uh, in the case of production sound, that's going to be the most common. But it could also be cases where you're feeding audio maybe from another mixer. That would be another case. Anytime... The audio has already been brought up to line levels when you would use a line level input on your 633. All right, Andrew has also some WYSIWYGOM MTP40s with the MCR42, but I'm still trying to set that up. Unclear to me what level gain I should be sending from the WYSIWYGOM to the 633. I keep finding very varied info. Okay, so that's where I, I don't know the WYSIWYGOM system in particular, so I, I apologize for that. But generally with the pro-level wireless systems like WYSIWYGOM, you can set it to, to line level output, and then you would set it to line level input on the 633. And that just avoids another, uh, another, another stage of doing amplification. So just better to avoid that if you can, because the, um, you know, the WYSIWYGOM receiver already has it at line level. So... That's, that's ideally what you would do. I did location sound on a Vampire Slayer film. Lots of quiet dialogue punctuated by blood-curdling screams. Tried to ride the game with some success. Yes, that is really hard. In fact, I on one of the shorts I worked on, The Army Nurse, um, some of you may have, we, we, we put that online. Um, I did the production sound on that, not the post, but um, we did have some of that as well where we ended up, what was interesting is that I knew there was going to be a screaming part because I'd read the script beforehand, but we ended up moving into the screaming part faster than I had anticipated. And so we ended up doing a longer take and they went straight into the screaming part. And so I wasn't prepared there. Fortunately, the audio limited A10 um, input limiters worked really, really well. We didn't have to do a retake. I was absolutely surprised at first time. Oh my gosh. And um, so I asked for just a second to review that before we went on. And it turned out that we didn't need to do a retake. I was really, really surprised and astonished and, and pleased. So, yeah, that's a tough one. Those uh, those horror films and those uh, vampire slayer films. So, Slav Guns. Oh, by the way, thanks for your previous stream on headphones. Picked up the ATM40X, upgraded the ear pads to the, the uh, brain waves, and wow, can now comfortably edit videos for hours and for live streams. Excellent. 
Uh, thanks for the thanks for feeding back that info on us or for us. That was that's good to know. Yeah, that's a, then it, of course it's going to be a very personal thing. Headphones are very very personal. I actually had someone criticize or what not criticize? I don't know. They said, "Why are you wearing those stupid looking headphones when you do your live streams?" Because they're comfortable, and they sound good. So um, that's why. <laughs> Klaus, thanks for the answer. Uh, well, thanks for the question, Klaus. Uh, do you ever use wireless monitoring in your monitors? And if so, what are you using and when? Or is this a no-go? Um, it can be a fine option. I would uh, generally, for in-ear monitors, a lot of those systems are actually analog. And the reason for that is you have less latency. Um, I think latency is a very big consideration when you're using in-ear monitors and wireless monitoring in general. And... Um, so Sennheiser, for example, makes an in-ear monitoring system. Um, so I think it is a go, but I think you probably want to stick with an analog system if you're going to do it. I don't usually use uh, wireless in-ear monitors. Um, that's just because I really like headphones. They just work better for me. They're more comfortable. I would prefer not to have the RF um, around as much RF around me if I can avoid it. <clears throat> if I'm doing production sound, I'd rather not, although there are some mixers and boom ops that do. Um, but I just prefer to use regular cans, just a preference, um, but, but there are some thoughts there. Trevor, late to the game tonight, was playing around with the sound bag tonight, trying to power wireless receivers off of a power brick, but get bad feedback into the Mix Pre 3 when more than one receiver powered off the same block. Oh, yes, um, definitely. That's where... Um, that's where a lot of the... I think... Uh, a power distribution system is going to be pretty helpful there. The power distribution systems, the good ones at least, and I think most of them do, the pro-level ones, because most of them are pro-level. I don't know if there's a consumer-level one out there. I have both the uh, PSC, Triple Play Mini, I think it's called, and I also have the Remote Audio BDS V4, V3, or whatever it, was, whatever it is. I don't remember what it's called, but they have some filtering built into those units so you can power multiple receiver units uh, from the same battery. And that's generally, I think, what you're going to find, Trevor, is it's going to be tricky if you if you don't have any of that filtering in between them. You can start to pick up that kind of stuff. So um, what I would consider is you, if you don't really have the budget for a for one of those systems or for one of, a battery distribution system, then you may want to look at using different um, batteries for each of the receivers there just to avoid that issue. That's a common one, people. Put a note in your books if you if you aren't doing multiple receivers yet. Um, you you probably want to look at a battery distribution system. So they serve more than just one purpose. They they serve more than just the purpose of powering an entire bag from a single battery. They also do that filtering, which is pretty important as well. Oh, and Slav Guns will be at NAB as well. So would love to say hello. Um, Mike Check One Two wants to know if there are any NAB rumors. Not that I know of. I, I'm not hearing anything. All right. When you need to run a long audio line? Um, with the 633, you can use AES out. That's true. Um, on the WYSIWYG. Okay, so I didn't know. The WYSIWYG evidently is capable of um, AES audio. So you could actually... This is going back to the questions, I believe, from Andrew... Yes, so for Andrew, um, you could use AES Digital Out from the WYSICOM and take that into input number one on your on your 633. And then you'll change the input to AES and then it will take a digital signal. So that actually is even better because then um, you're not doing multiple analog to digital, digital to analog, and then back to analog to digital conversions. So. Um, I wasn't aware that that particular model of WYSICOM was able to do that. So anyway, definitely something to consider there as well. We can talk about that in more detail if you need to at some point. And yeah, Greg, good question. So yes, on my um, on my A10 wireless, I typically use AES3 output. So that way I can run two channels from the, um, from the A10 system into the Sound Devices 888 or 633. And uh, then I don't have to go through that conversion again. So that's the ideal situation. Um, now I am looking forward to, Sound Devices has announced their new SL2, I think it's called, 
which is a two slot um, system that hooks up to the 833 or the 888 or the Scorpio. And you can put two dual channel receivers in that and then that connects to the 888 and then you don't have to run any wires. So I'm looking forward to that and I have to make a decision is that going to suffice or do I want to go for something that has three slots? Um, so there's still some debating in my mind. Typically for most of my jobs, two slots is going to be enough, four channels of wireless. But there may be situations where I might need more. So anyway. Is there a BDS that can run off of V-mount batteries or are they only for use with the, quote, smart batteries? Yes. Um, yeah, it's just a matter of getting the right cable to run a V-mount or a, an Anton Bauer gold mount. Any battery with a DTAP output um, into your BDS. So it's just a matter of getting the P-tap, D-tap um, over to the correct type of uh, either, I think they're typically four pin, three pin or four pin inputs onto the BDS system. So I think it's a four pin that goes into the BDS systems. So yes, that is definitely possible. All right. Uh, AS3 output sample rate is 44.1 kilohertz, correct? Does that mess you up? Um, I always thought the recording went into 48, but I need to double check that. Greg, I know that the, the transmission on the A10 system is 44.1, but I don't know if it's doing a uh, resampling or not. I think it's always... It's always been recorded into 48 kilohertz. So it's it's you basically set the sample rate for the recorder and that everything gets recorded at that. So there may be some resampling going on there at some point. Good question. And something for me to look into. And Trevor. Okay. Well, everybody, that takes us up to about an hour for tonight. Thanks to everyone for joining and for the questions. Um, we will be Again, as I mentioned before, doing a little bit more work with Dante and probably have some additional videos coming up here pretty soon where we talk about some of the other scenarios where you might want to use that and kind of give a demonstration on how it works in a little bit more detail. Just something to keep in mind, just something to kind of, it's good to learn about the technology so that you have those options when they, you know, a need may arise in the future for you. So get out there and make some great sound and we'll talk to all of you again here real soon. Take care.